hold on. Okay. Okay now. So the last okay, no, now. Oh, yesterday it was like the event was blowing one of those long horns. <laughs> yeah, it was. You know, it was, uh, apparently, in the Tibetan culture, the that the high uh, oboe sounding, yeah, and then the deep horn, like a Swiss long horn thing. Mountain people seem to have those things. Uh, these the fierce Dharma protectors like those sounds. <laughs> They consider that sweet music. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that's why Tibetans have that kind of music. I'm sorry, your question. So you were speaking about trying to get into the clear blue light. I can't. You need a microphone because uh, just you press really the, the clear blue light. Yeah. When you can't hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Stand up. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so um, oh, good. I tried to find the clear blue light when I went to bed the last two nights, but before I know it, I'm asleep. I'm come here, bro. You're trying to find what? The clear blue light. When I went to sleep. But oh, you did? I oh. can't find I fall asleep, and then before I know it, I woke up. So I don't well, know. Well, I know it didn't take too long to keep you awake. Looking for it. I was looking for it. Maybe it was a blue light. That's, maybe it, that's a good way if it works. You know, it's better than ambient. But um, it isn't a clear blue light. You know, there's a. There's a you know, the, the layers of thing in the Book of the Dead, you know, in the Red Book of the Dead, which pretty much agrees with different tantras, and sometimes the, the, um, the go-arounds are a little different, you know, the, the sequence of them. But, you know, there's these eight stages of dissolution, they're called. And they're called, you know, they're labeled earth to water, water to fire, fire to wind, wind to space. Or sometimes they say wind to consciousness, you know, like they are consciousness. But those are the first four. And they have like um, uh, the hallucination or mirage. The inner experience is like the experience of a mirage. Then uh, water to fire, the inner experience is like uh, fireflies. And uh, no, smoke, I'm sorry, water to fire is smoke, a smoky experience, like you're in a just. You don't see with your ordinary eyes there. The hallucination is the last bit of seeing with ordinary eyes when you're dissolving, either yogically or actually physically dying. And then, and then you see things, it's like you're all surrounded with smoke. And then there's the, the fire to air or fire to wind is um, a fireflies, like a swarm of fireflies, or sometimes I think sparks maybe. Sparks or fireflies, like psh, like that, or sometimes a moiré pattern, like when you throw like raindrops in a still pond surface, you know, it goes like that. And then there's a single clear candle flame. Then there's a moonlit space, and that's and that's a candle flame is wind to consciousness, or wind to space. Then space to what uh, state? That's called I call it luminance. Some people in some books call it appearance which is actually not very good because actually you disappear. You're beginning to disappear, really, rather than appear. But anyway, it's like everything is a white, moonlit luminosity. Then everything is an explosive, bright sunlight, sunlit, reddish, you know, like a rising sun, a, lumin a, a radiance. And then the third state is a darkness. So that's, that's what you're looking for when you fall asleep, is, Conking out darkness, right? So this isn't really that you're looking for blue. Oh, hi, Kevin. We were just talking a few questions. You did use the time. The thing, the you talk, the those, one does sort of today. Get your name. Those share are getting more. And then you're doing the real practice, and I thought I would contextualize, you know. Today. But anyway, I'm just answering his question. He looked for blue light last night when he fell asleep. But he didn't see the blue light, he just fell asleep. <laughs> so that was the question. Yes? So I just thought if there were some general questions since waiting for you, I thought I would say. Is it on? But I think usually it's hard for me to hear questions that are my favorite. Yes? I practice the menless sleep, and I was posed with a question in yes. my sleep. And the question was, if you have a problem in the physical world, how will you heal it in the field of light? That was how it was presented. How would you heal it? How would you heal a physical problem in the field of light? That was in my dream. That oh, was, you did. That oh, was how a question. Auspicious. And what, what was the answer? 
<laughs> there, was a, there was a lot of different physical problems presented, and there was a voice that asked me the questions. I never saw who it was. A teacher was asking me the questions. But I, I woke up because I saw that I was dreaming. So that yeah. was as far as I got. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. So we then I can answer that question better than me. But uh, if you're not ready, well, you know, we can hang that. But that's exactly what we're all looking for. How, how does the mind fix the problem? And actually, that's the basis. You know, I, you know, Gemma has this other book that he hasn't been talking about, or maybe you did in the uh, sessions I wasn't here. It's called Mirror of Light. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love that book. We did. We have another event we did last year on the Mirror of Light. And the Mirror of Light represents, you know, the person of this Utok. You know, and this is the younger you talk. So that's, I wanted to give that history contextualization about that. And of course, that's all that you talk is doing. That's what Medicine Buddha is doing. In other words, how does Buddha's vision of the total positive reality of Nirvana being the actual reality of things, how can that be channeled and funneled and implemented to beings who are gripped by delusion, you know, misknowledge, ignorance, mis misknowing, you know, mistakenly knowing, how can it be channeled to become therapeutic for them? And yesterday, Tianla blew my mind by translating a mantra as psychotherapy. Yeah. I never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> it was really good, actually. Because you know, it's a traditional thing. Man is like manas, the Sanskrit word manas, which means mind, mentality. And uh, tra is like tara, you know, it means delivering or liberating. Mm -hmm. So it means uh, they, you know, liberating the mind or protecting the mind. They can take it either way. You know, like Tara is a protector. Tara means to save or to protect. You know, so that is psychotherapy, absolutely. So, so through psychotherapy, in other words, psychotherapy means, and since things are psychosomatic, then that means if your mind is enlightened, then you will be, you will be able to heal yourself. Mm -hmm. And then this morning, I had a little bit of a, not a dream, but I had a thought came to me, but the way the day went, I didn't have time to write it. But I actually believe, and we can, I think, accurately say, I could argue, that a person's becoming a Buddha in, the, in any universe is sort of like an astrophysical event. It's like a... It's the opposite of a black hole. Remember, we recently had this thing where two black holes collided, remember that? And they measured it with a laser beam, that with two laser beams that were several mi a mile or something long. <laughs> the two laser beams went blip, blip or something. And they, they analyzed, you know, their whole set of theories made that the collision of two black holes. Which, in a way, can't really collide because they should have eaten each other, you know? Because supposedly black holes where everything gets sucked in. So a black hole is like a physical symbol of utter selfishness. <laughs> and, and the center of a black hole would be hell, basically. And everything totally compressed and nothing can escape. And uh, it's sort of a physical model of, of that, you could say. And, um, and a Buddha is the opposite. A Buddha is a being who completely expands and embraces everything and beca feels it becomes a presence. Everything becomes the presence of a Buddha, what's called Dharmakaya of the Buddha. Dharma there meaning reality, or even Nirvana it actually means, emptiness, reality, the ultimate. A body of the ultimate. So what that means is that, that for example, right now, everyone who ever became a Buddha, and they're supposedly infinite numbers, they feel that they are us, and the building, and the table, and the floor, and the trees, and everything. But it doesn't bother them to feel that. That's why it's kind of inconceivable. They're like a giant CAT scan that never got turned off. And therefore, but, and, but then they've been, they, they're in a state of perfect joy, feeling they are all of us. If you can th think about that, empathetically feeling all of us. But their perfect joy does not blind them to our failure to feel full of joy. So it's a very strange thing when you can expand to embrace everything then you feel everything as if it were blissful. When you contract to get away from what you think of some bad things, then you become uh, uh, not unblissful because you're guarded and armored and protected and imprisoned yourself. So, so therefore, when some being becomes a Buddha, it's like they have this experience 
of being everything, and it's not just an escaping into, you know, there are some forms of spiritual traditions that think that the high thing is to just disappear from everything, and it all just doesn't exist, and it's like, and even emptiness is misunderstood that way, uh, that it's just, a, you know, so they don't, you know, where it's all one, and it's all me, but it isn't really me, because there's no one else, but I'm all by myself, and I don't care. <laughs> But that's not Buddha, because Buddha cares. But so it's all Buddha, it's all bliss, but Buddha cares because some parts of it, the other beings, who he doesn't think they're other, actually. He experiences them as if they were themselves, from within themselves, sort of within their islands. But they think that things are other than them. So therefore they are feeling overwhelmed by a big universe that they can't handle. So then the compassion of a Buddha makes the Buddha do something for them, you know. And here, and then medicine Buddha does it through healing, body and mind, you know. A Buddha does it, the highest thing is through teaching, because by people coming to new understanding, then they can heal themselves, sort of idea, right? So, but I was thinking that when a being in the particular field of beings, who are not ultimately different from each other, goes, into, goes through that experience of, or actually becomes that experience of being all of them, you know, so that he's like in love with all beings, that means. And what we would think of as in love, right? If you're in love, you become the beloved, sort of. It's all one, you know. And uh, they are more important than, than yourself previously. So, so a Buddha is a being who has this kind of explosive uh, awareness that incorporates everything. And that's like a um, star exploding. It's like a pulsar. It's like all this energy, channeling all this love energy in all directions. And, but in a very precise way, because it isn't just some sort of smashing bright light that people would then put on sunglasses or take a parasol to protect themselves from the flow of energy that they would be frightened about because they feel separate from what's not them. Mm. And so it's all skillfully modulated to, you know, to reach them in a way that can be ultimately beneficial for them. And the, and the guarantee of the ultimate beneficiality of that energy coming from such an event as an individual becoming a Buddha, uh, the, is so um, is basically kind of cosmic. It's like suddenly in the field there's a there's a field, there's a subliminal emanation that the the way to happiness is to give yourself to the universe in a certain way, rather than fight it off, which is we are all trying to fight it off. The universe, the, the misknowing person wants to fight off the universe because they think it's going to devour them. Time will kill them, sickness will get them, old age, you know, death, you know. So that we want to keep away from all of that. But, uh, but then when one being in that field who's all interconnected by vibes with everybody else has the opposite and goes inside out, so to speak. Suddenly everybody feels there's a doorway to freedom in that, somehow. Right? They automatically, subliminally though, it's like there's a place that is not just everybody confirming that everybody else should be fighting dog-eat-dog dog one against another. Somebody embraces all, and therefore when the, when the devil, Mara, challenges Buddha at the time of his enlightenment, how dare you be a Buddha? Who asked you? Oh, you're a Buddha? Like, we don't want to hear about that type of thing, right? Mara says, you know, do. And then uh, Buddha says, well, uh, uh, you got to be Mara because you did one good thing in a previous life to a fellow devil. You gave him like a glass of water when he was thirsty. And by that one unselfish act, you now are the king of all the devils. You're the head devil. And I did great things for in infinite past lives for infinite people. I gave my body, my eyes, my head, my blood, my family, my kingdom, my wealth. Again and again and again and again and again, lifetime after lifetime. You know, like, like a mother gives from her blood and her calcium. <laughs> or whatever else, uh, to a child. And so Buddha, uh, and he said, then the devil said to him, trying to trap him finally to that, so therefore I now am going to be a Buddha, because that's the way of really giving to everyone. He doesn't really say it, like he just says, therefore now I can become a Buddha. Then the devil says to him, well, what's your witness? You are, with your clairvoyance, are a witness that I did a good thing and gave a glass of water to somebody, as if you had a witness for karma, for the causality of karma to work. And, uh, 
And Buddha said, who's your witness? To all, although you say you did all those things, but who, how do you prove it? Who's the witness? And that's why the Buddha touches the ground like this with his hand. He touched the Mother Earth, and Mother Earth jumps up and says, I'm the witness, I was here, he did it on Earth. And I saw him, like, when he was an elephant, he fed his body to a caravan full of starving people. When he was a rabbit, he jumped in the fire. And all this. There's all these stories, you know, the former infinite, of the infinite former lives of the Buddha. Just a few are taught. So, so anyway, what I woke up, Gelar, was thinking that, therefore, when any one being becomes like that completely, it sort of opens the door of liberation to everyone else. That person becomes like the opposite of a black hole, becomes like a pulsar of encouraging energy that goes out to everyone. Because in a way, it's through the discovery that there is no place to grasp and control and dominate and own. There, there is no such place. So everything is given away. You know, Buddha is like, you know, Buddha is a transcendent giving. It's Buddhahood. It's, like, it's the transcendence of giving. Okay? So then within that, uh, Buddha became Medicine Buddha, and then he taught all these wonderful healing things. And then I think that the Buddhist monks, you know, there are stories about, I think, wasn't there a story, one, what was one monk who was, you know, all diarrhea over himself, and he had dysentery, and he was in terrible shape, the other monks were repelled about him, and they were leaving, leaving him in a heap. And Buddha came there, and he scolded them, and he started cleaning him up himself, and said they should always do that. I believe there's, a, there's an incident like that. Uh, in the, even in the, in the Pali literature, at least there is, and I'm sure it is in the, in the uh, Vinaya of the, uh, of the Sarvasyavara, the Tibetan monk's code. And uh, the Buddhist monks probably spread this healing knowledge around India. But it all radiates from the fact that somebody proved that the great thing is to give yourself to the universe, and did it by doing it. And we all feel, therefore, we're in this fortunate position, evolutionarily and historically, to be aware that that is possible, and that that is fully fulfilling. And that's a kind of, that's, a, that's an implication, a logical implication of a discovery that reality is blissful and perfect and clear light and whatever you want to call it. Blue, blue, it can be blue to <laughs> blue, green, yellow, red, white, and, and uh, that... Uh, uh, so that by giving yourself to it, then you become that. You follow me? So that, so that fact. So then the, all of this comes to us. Then and then, the great adepts of India, which was the most, it was California of the ancient world, you know, of ancient Eurasia, you know. It was the most advanced place, you know. Best climate, richest economy, either mineral, vegetable, fruit, 2,000 varieties of mangoes, you know, it was like, Jewels, you know, Maharajas giving their weight in jewels every year. It was really, that's why the British and all the foreigners got, uh, for that, the Muslims got after it, because it was this really rich place compared to the desert, West Asia, you know, to China with all its floods and things. And, um, and they, so they developed these, they tolerated all these amazing, wonderful people. They didn't persecute the holy people like in the, in the more poor places, where they wouldn't want people dropping out from fighting in the wars or planting the plants or beating the women or burying the children and, to, and going and being monks and nuns and attaining some sort of personal evolutionary fulfillment. They didn't want that in the poorer places. They wanted to dragoon everybody. And, uh, and, but in India they tolerated because they had a surplus of everything. And so there were all these great people. And then they saw, those adepts, they saw history. They knew who were the Muslims. They knew people coming by boat and with weapons and things from South Asia, from West Asia. And uh, I don't know, I'm sure the Enlightened Ones knew even about the Europeans with all of their violent colonialism later. But anyway, a thousand years ago, or 12, 1300 years ago, they said, well, we need a place to save this treasure because although these people, now that our people are more gentle and civilized and, and capable, they're, they're going to be not able to fight off some lesser people who just want to conquer somebody and beat them up and take their stuff, you know, consume them. And so we need to keep our place. Where can we keep it? And then they looked north of India, up in the mountains, and they saw Gerla's lineage. So Zandovas and Mongolians and Tibetans, and but especially those who had amazing, who, I, who were particularly amazing because they could live at this high altitude. Yeah. You know, and they slowly filtered up from the lowlands around them. 
and they taught them, and they and th those were and they were not discriminating against them. Those were people, like they the Tibet was like a giant pentagon. They conquered everybody around them when they felt like going out and looting and pillaging. They even conquered China at one time for a short time in Tang Dynasty, and they took control of the Silk Route. And they were and the one good thing about them, as far as their neighbors were concerned was that since they liked living at high altitude, the lack of oxygen made them high <laughs> in the light, and they liked that. They never colonized. They didn't settle down in some lowland river valley. They considered that a, like a sludgy way to... Nomads in general don't like cities. They think they're kind of... In the ancient Rig Veda, in the early mandalas of the Rig Veda, the ones that nobody ever reads, they are talking about how the big cities of the Indus Valley are like anthills. And they should stamp on them. They call their god to stamp on them and scatter them so that then they can gallop their horses on them. You know, like no men are like that. So then the Tibetans, they taught them this wonderful new vision. They felt the impact of this being who turned himself inside out and himself, herself, itself, whatever you want to call it, at that stage of a Buddha, you know, infinite loving energy. And uh, they decided that was more fun than conquering some Chinese and Nepalese and Persians and other people, and Mongolians around them. And, uh, and then they became these great Dharma people. And then, and they, and then, and then in the process, the, the medicine came up from, knowledge came up from India. They had their own shamans who were knowledgeable, but much more sophisticated stuff came out of India. Connecting, you know, this is, it's an amazing thing. Bile, phlegm, and, and, uh, and wind, you know, that they should be exactly correlative to anger, delusion, and lust. And that, and that therefore you can deal with your psychotherapy, psychosomatic issues through the dealing with them as the three poisons of mind, or you can, you can look at them as poisons of the body because body-mind ultimately are interconnected. It's just a question of how to get all the cells of the body to know that they are light cells. So that they're consciously being like cells, so whatever you know, not just the not just the conceptual mind, you know? but you need the conceptual mind to do it apparently. So, so then, um, so then, this wonderful thing happened where, you know, the kings at first, the kings and the nobles, uh, they they realized this was a better way to live than having to control their troops and go and conquer people and make treaties amongst themselves and fight with each other and then. So could sort of wait in between campaigns and then to satisfy the soldiers who are uptight in order to be able to kill, they have to, they have to, be, have, to have new loot and they have to pillage and attack another uh, society near them to get something. And so, you know, it's unstable. Militarism is an unstable thing. And they realized that the great cultures of India and by that time China and even Central Asia, so all around them, all the great cultures were Buddhist in the sense that they knew about this self-explosion, you know, selflessness realization that was spreading, that spread from the Buddha's realization. And they knew about it, and um, so they brought it into their people. And then some of them fought it, and after a couple hundred years there was a big reaction against it, and they said, we're going back to our more military thing. But by that time the people decided they preferred not being troops, not living like that, being wow. more happy and friendly, being nicer to their wives, whatever, girlfriends. And, um, and so even though there was a, like an 80 year, 100 year period where their Buddhism was sort of put into stagnation, except for some private people, uh, still it came back because the people by then wanted after the collapse of the empire, you know. Because it, it collapsed because it couldn't control by violence, which is how empires are controlled. When it started, when from the top dominators, they started spreading the Dharma, then they sort of, when they, they worked themselves out of a job. Because then people said they didn't want to be dominated, they didn't want to be sent off on a campaign to China or something to get some loot. You know, they'd rather live happily and eat rocks and drink chan and eat zampa, you know. <laughs> like the Tibetans do, and unfortunately eat the occasional yak, like nomads do, you know. So, so then you have you talk, and then there's this beautiful thing here. Gela is in this great book. He he says I was looking, I was trying to prepare Gela, do the homework, and they were they were looking here, looking here where he said, uh, 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 he said uh, introduction, he says. Um, 
that uh, where is it here? Yes. Oh no, that's not what I was looking for. I forgot where it is. But anyway, uh, the you talk elder you talk was transmitted. Uh, well, you said it here. It was transmitted from from uh, directly from Manjushri or something, and then. Uh, where is that? What page? Do you remember, Gila? In the history? No, you start right in with the practice. Yeah, that's the meditative visualization. I found it this morning and it was so close, I wanted to tell everybody. He says. And you told song, I think. No. Right in the beginning somewhere. But anyway, so that the senior you told, so, oh yeah, so then King Chisong Dezen, who was an emperor of the empire in China in the late 8th, early 9th century, he decided that this medicine was a super huge thing, and it was very important to his civilization. So he organized a big conference that lasted for 40 years, 45 years, in the first monastery that was built in Tibet called Sanye Monastery. And then he called doctors from the co royal courts of all of the neighbors who were scared of him because they were big fighters, the Tibetans, and had the you know, knowledgeable physicians sent from India, from Nepal, from Bengal. Those were different countries at that time. India wasn't one country. From Bengal, from Kashmir, from Nepal, from, um, uh, from China, from, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, from China. And um, he had these people sent. And then they sat and compared notes on the framework of the Buddhist medicine idea coming from the original Buddha. Because Buddhas, the Four Noble Truths are like a medical diagnosis. So he initially was a doctor rather than a prophet or something, or, you know, I'm going to save you. It wasn't at all. You know, it's like a good doctor doesn't pretend they save you. They realize they just help you bring your own health out. So, so did you find that little passage? I'm, I'm giving it in summary. I, I forgot what I thought. It was so good about how, how uh, it was received. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, here it is. The Yutok Ningtik was first taught, and the Ningtik, of course, the heart drop, which is what this is. This is advanced stuff. You, you, got, you found the camera, thank you. It says, um, uh, was first taught in the pure land of Tanaduk by the medicine Buddha. So it's from Buddha, that, that's a way of saying it's from Buddha, in his medicine Buddha form. Then, again, in Udayana, which was something like Afghanistan, actually, on Earth, where Padmasambhava came from, the founder of Buddhism, in, the adept founder of Buddhism in Tibet in the uh, 8th century. And, uh, and that's where you talk, the elder, the older you talk, went and got that teaching again from Padmasambhava in Udhyana. And then finally, it was taught to Yutak, it was this paragraph, thank you, Gemma. It was taught to Yutak Yandeng Gombo the Younger, which is the, this, 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 this uh, gentleman here, this Buddha there, uh, by the wisdom Dakini. Oh, he had a Dakini guru. Oh, ho, ho, like Yela did. Right? <laughs> did you tell him about your guru, the nun? Famous nun? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Uh, the, uh, wisdom Dakini felt in town, to which it became known as the profound, pure vision, Dharma cycle it is today, although I would call that Dharma collection or Dharma, Dharma teaching. And um, so, from this we can see that maintaining the welfare of sick beings, this is in regard to your question, as one's primary aim is the sign of extensive and authentic spirit of enlightenment, bodhicitta, you know, the, the enlightenment soul, and is the achievement, the selflessness gene, let's say, which is something that you, you find in yourself, and then you're there for all beings. It's like the seed of that Buddhahood experience where you become all the beings, you know, in a loving way, if you follow me. So, uh, Westerners can't, it, it, it's a period of enlightenment is how I translate people, Bodhi mind, people say things like that. And is the achievement of mastery as a Bodhisattva. From this profound path, you talk the elder achieved in his lifetime the state of an awareness holder or a Vidyada. A vidya, and Vidya means uh, awareness holder in one way, but one way Vidya also means science. The five sciences are called the Panja Vidya. 
So it means no, science means knowledge, you know. So Vidyadara means a scientist, actually. I had a friend, a translator, a young Tibetan guy, and um, the Vidyadaras are usually depicted in art. They're in the Book of the Dead paintings, for example, and they're like yogis. They look like sadhus with long hair, and maybe a bone ornament in the hair, and have like a little loincloth, and it looks like that. And the one translator said, no, you can't say Vidyadara is a scientist. Scientists wear white coats, and they have a little white thing on top of their head, you know, that they look like. And the Vidyadaras are like naked adepts, nearly naked, like sadhus, actually. Those are the real scientists, you know, actually. So he lived in the state of Vidyadara, and he lived until the age of 125. I like that. And then along with his consort and all of his holdings, achieved the great transference of the rainbow body. Uh, you know, transference, I like to translate as soul ejection. <laughs> you, know, you, know, like, you know, like an ejection seat in a jet airplane, and you're a jet pilot and you're crashing, you press a button and your seat goes like, <laughs> like <laughs> and then the parachute opens. So the poa means, they call it, people do translate transference, but I'd say great ejection, you know. So they shoot out of the ordinary body, the rainbow body. And then in the 12th century, in front of many attendants, you talk the younger pass into the rainbow body of the great transference without any obstacle that well, as well. So there can be no doubt at all of the great significance of the guru lineage of the Yutok, the Yingti, the heart drop of Yutok. And then there's this like hippie looking guy, and it's a picture. <laughs> it's a good picture of Yama. How old were you then, Yama? 20 something? Uh, 23. That oh. was the summer of love. Well, <laughs> <laughs> San Francisco, nobody was in Tibet. And look at the hair, I love that. And you're stirring the elixir of immortality. Yes. And look at that. I'm sorry, but I love that picture. <laughs> then I become younger. What? In this picture, I look older, right? No, you don't look older. <laughs> no, you look really amazed. I think you're beginning your... You're in the earlier part of your world mission to live up to the spirit of Yutok. Yeah. You know, then Yutok, you know, the, Yutok became a Buddha, I think. See, the great thing also is, it isn't also, although it's a psych astrophysical event, someone becoming a Buddha, like, a, like the opposite of a black hole, a pulsar, you know, in the, on a planet, and then everybody gets a little, maybe I can get liberated, you know. Otherwise, why would, you know, people don't think they're going to be liberated. Like, you have a tigress or something, or a lioness on the African, you know, veldt, you know, this there. And she's there, and then, you know, the lazy male lion doesn't do any hunting, and the cubs are here, she has to swat him away not to mess with the cubs. And then she has to run out and chase antelopes and drag them back. And within that sort of instinct-driven survival, subsistence livelihood of that tigress, where is she going to have an idea, oh, I can get liberated from this tiger eat antelope evolutionary life niche. There's some way of getting more free than that. And maybe they see a little bushman running along a Maasai warrior or something, and they see the Maasai warrior is maybe riding a horse, or I don't know what they do, or driving a jeep nowadays. They say, oh, that guy, he can do more things, you know. I, I don't have to pause to drive a jeep. Maybe I would be better off like that. Although I wouldn't be able to run and catch antelope the same way, but oh, they have guns, they shoot them. Oh, hey, maybe I'm good. But wh how would a tigress think that? In other words, you know, the tigress, I, feel, I think, she just had her litter. She fought off the male guy. The other tigress has maybe brought her some, some stew for lunch for a while, because she's back on her feet in a few days. And then she's charging to get the next meal for the brood and for the and and whatever and then as she's going after this herd of antelope there's a pregnant one pregnant antelope who is going slower than the other antelopes and then there's a horrible stringy looking one <laughs> with a broken horn and, and who's faster though and some other ones and she could easily get that pregnant one but somehow, subliminally, she feels empathetically because she was just carrying like four or five little cubs in her belly for some period of time. And she senses that this animal is doing that. Contrary to the main thing, that the main concept of a tigress, that's food. It's just food on the hoof. 
And then, so there's some life there. And so it swerves away from the easier victim and grabs the, the stringy old crappy one, skinny old one. But at least has some bones to crunch up and a little meat. <laughs> Doesn't go after the juicy pregnant one. And then my, my, that would be that tiny little increment of like identifying with another in front of you then leads to humanity from Buddhist evolutionary description. Buddha's, Buddha's Darwin. That's what it is. It makes you a little, but it's very hard for an animal. If you, if you really think about that, if you understand it as a scientific explanation of evolution, of the individual, then you will realize you will value yourself as a human being much more. Because you will realize that you, although you can't remember it, you were an animal like that, and you had those kind of little tiny impulses in the midst of your basic get that food for the tribe there, you know, for the pack or for whatever you call it, you know, and eat that thing, and it's not, it's just your food, it's not another being. And yet you somehow identified with the other being, the alien being. And then that made you the, expand your awareness of the world and see it from that other perspective at that so tiny increment as an animal can do. And that's how you work your way up to being a human from a Buddhist point of view. Therefore, they say that the karmic evolutionary root of humanity is ethics. So fascinating. Shila, the second of the transcendences. The, 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 the human being got to be human by being ethical among animals. Because ethical means, doesn't mean following a rule because someone told the tigress not to ch chase the pregnant one, because some later anthropologist said, oh, that's just doing that because the tigress knows there'll be two deer to eat later. That's what they say in biogrammarians, what they call, you know, the materialists say things like that. That's ridiculous. They, it's an it's a empathy on the part of the mother tiger, you know, that she has. And so, uh, if, you, if you do that, then you, you will appreciate yourself. And you'll realize why they say that the human being will not, thank you for taking the mic, the human being that you have, the platform, the evolutionary platform of the human embodiment that you have is incredibly precious and very difficult to create. And it is created by your own evolutionary effort and your own development of ethics into where you become a being that has the ability to identify with many other beings, actually. We all know we identify with the beloved when we're in love and with the child when we, when we are par parenting and so on. And we all know that we can do that. But of course, and we also know in the case of extraor more extraordinary beings in extraordinary circumstances that they can identify with a lot of beings, right? And then Buddhahood is just identifying with all beings. Yes, what's the question? You piqued our curiosity about um, Dr. Nita. Uh, I'm sorry? I said you have piqued our curiosity about Dr. Nita. Yes, um, cause, all about his biography. Yeah, we, because we can read a little bit about you took in the books. I know, but, but he we doesn't can't, really tell. That we part. can't read anything about Dr. Nita and his experience with the Dakini well, and that sort of thing. Because, you know, Dr. Nita is saying that thereby that it's not about him. He said it's about his healing work, you know. But yes, it will be inspiring too. That, that's it. But I'm, I'm still back in his predecessors, whether his previous incarnation or his previous teacher. So I'm still trying to get into that. Just so, because you know why it's so alien to us, the idea. We are materialists. If somebody levitated, we'd, go, we'd all go nuts. <laughs> we'd have them arrested, you know, like E.T., the movie. E.T. is able to do things like his little finger turns into a light bulb, you know, and he's in the closet there and all that. And all they want to do is dissect him, you know, and he has to escape on a levitating bicycle. <laughs> so we have that in movies and things and in dreams, but we don't believe in it. We kids, we're our consensual reality, even if logically I have reached after 50 years of study, I have reached a place, or maybe, pre maybe many previous lifetimes too, but I reached a place where to me, I can't exclude the possibility of what we, people would think were miracles. Mm -hmm. you know, logically, I think it's really prejudiced and dogmatic to think that people cannot do things that we don't imagine. You know, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt up in your philosophy. Even Shakespeare said so, right? Yeah. But still, if I saw somebody levitate, I'd be like Carlos Castaneda in that book, you know, and I might like have a freak out about my reality is collapsing, you know. Because it would just be so against the laws of the, what is our consensual reality, which we reinforce in each other 
in this materialistic culture and even world now that we're in. So, so, so to be, you know, the third noble truth, the Buddha says, realize it. But realizing it, you know, each noble truth, he says, the first one, the truth of suffering, he says, acknowledge it. The second one, the truth of the origin of suffering, he says, analyze it and investigate it and understand it. And then the third one, he says, realize it. But realizing the first way of realizing nirvana or Buddhahood or any kind of, or that there is such a thing as a Buddha, as a state, an evolutionary state that a living being can reach, in fact, all living beings will reach, given the infinity of time, then uh, it's difficult, the first way of realizing it is to try to imagine it. And it's very difficult to imagine, right? And then, and, and, and therefore, finding out about Genla, for example, would be finding out about someone who took these teachings really seriously as a life and death matter at a young age, and he went out, and over here, I would say he's been eating rocks for a few weeks in this picture. <laughs> you know, they have this Julian retreat, these fasting retreats, where they take like a mineral or a certain herb or calcite. something. What? Calcite. No. Calcite. Zhongxi. Calcite. Calcite. Yeah. Uh, that's like a mineral, right? Calcite, yes. yes. And, uh, and they don't eat any other thing. They very little water, right? Almost no water. And then they have visions and whatever. And then they're stirring it over here. <laughs> I love it. So the point is, he took it really seriously, and he luckily started young, and he, and he developed in this direction. And, you know, the only, and only Buddha would know how, what, how much he developed. We can't say it. But it's interesting to know about his life. It's inspiring. So, yeah, I'm coming to that. But I'm still back with the you, you talk the younger. So then you talk the younger taught this amazing set of things, all in this book, which I think was collected by Genla's company, right? The, the Nagma Institute, Nagma, right? The 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 shaman, the Nagpas, you know, the mantrikas in in Ando. They collected this and they uh, these different things in there, and uh, which we which Genla read from when he did both. So the first one we did was a U-talk initiation, and the second one was a long life. The U-talk one was for the Ningtik itself, or just a partial? It was in a way the seed of the, it wasn't extensive, it was the brief. So in other words, you were all introduced to the advanced teaching of this, but you know, the great thing about those advanced teachings is they're really, really advanced, and you know, now that you receive them, you're so lucky, and blah, 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 the lamas always say, then they say, oh yeah, now there's a few preliminaries. <laughs> like, how about a hundred thousand prostrations? <laughs> you ever try that? <laughs> and, you know, so they get up to a couple thousand a day. That's all the way full. It's like a push-up. It's like a, a, a downward dog, push-up, flat on the floor, forehead touching, two hands touching over here, feet, knees, belly. Then stand up again and do a thought to think of doing a thousand of them in a row. And they can do something two, three thousand a day, I think, right? And then they do a hundred thousand. Uh, there's a, that's one of the preliminaries. Then a the hundred thousand offering of these mandals, yeah. you know, then a hundred thousand guru yogas of visualizing, you know, visualizing the teacher in a certain type of visualization. Then a hundred, and there's a lot of other things that often they have. If you know the life of Milarepa, he had to build three towers, four towers, three towers. And then the fourth one he left, four towers actually, and the first three were demolished by his teacher after he built them. Oh. And it had to put, and not only demolished them, just knocked down, <coughs> he had to take the rocks of building like a nine-story tower three times. And then he had to take each rock and put it back where he got it from, and <laughs> had to go do it again, all in different shapes. These are the, those were the four, four chakras, I think, basically, those were. Each tower had the shape of the central core of, you know, the triangle, circle, square, and uh, uh, oval of the different towers, you know. So there are all these preliminaries, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's great to do preliminaries in the context of something really magnificent yeah. that you're preliminary to, rather than just doing them. Okay, so then he did that. And then that remained in the heart of Tibetan medicine since then, although his successors, you know, these people keep coming back, you know, because life and death, you know, he, so he went in rainbow body, but that doesn't mean it doesn't come back. Rainbow body is a nice goal and a target, but then rainbow, Buddha all have rainbow bodies, and they keep coming back 
to help other beings. You know, because once you identify with all beings, then you cannot leave anybody unhelped who needs help. It's impossible because you are them in their need for help at the same time as you are the source of help. You see, and once you're in that kind of situation with another, then it's like automatic, like like my hand. It's, uh, it had uh, it, I, it got burned or something, or it has some pain in it, and um, I have to fix that pain because it's part of it, you know. Although it's my hand, you know, I could chop it off and forget about it, but I've got to fix it. So other beings become like limbs. Uh, Shantideva says all beings become like limbs of a single life, which doesn't mean that they're all the same in some categorical manner. It means they are actually the same the way they are. Which is quite the way they end, not only the way they really are, but the way they think they are, both. Both how they really are, which is fine, and what they think they are, which is miserable. <laughs> and dissatisfied, and incomplete, and like looking for something. Looking for something in all the wrong places. <laughs> anyway. So there we go. And then. And then, uh, so Gelag gave us that, and, and I never heard anyone do it the way you did, Gelag. And I really appreciate it, where you talked about the different chakras, you know, and then there's these different five wisdoms, as they're called. But I don't know if wisdom is exactly the right word. You know, the, the word, it's very interesting. The word, word for wisdom, you know, when you have a wisdom, which is the opposite of ignorance, which is the wisdom of selflessness, you know. Uh, primarily, or wisdom of emptiness. And that means uh, a knowledge that you have by being one with what you're knowing. So it's an experiential, non-conceptual knowledge, though it is pointed to, its direction is indicated by conception, and a conception of negation. In other words, selflessness is a negation, right? No, lack of a self, it means selflessness. And so selflessness means that you are actually, why don't we all meditate that for, can we do that? I'd like them to meditate. Can everyone meditate? I'd like them to meditate on something. Is that okay? Yes. 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 Okay. So everyone, okay, try to med sit in a meditative way. No, you don't have to sit on the floor. Cross your ankles, right? Gedla has been telling you how to meditate for sure. She has a new belt. Oh, that's nice. You're not deep. You've got a nice belt. Uh, that's gomtak, that's called. Meditation cord, beautiful. Look at that. But that's too okay. small. Well, okay. It's not a waistband. It goes from the back to the knees, right? Okay, never mind. So, okay, go into meditative mode, okay? And that just means breathe, concentrate, okay? And ideally, eyes half open and looking past the tip of, right at the tip of your nose or a little past it. So you have a half lidded eyes. So you're not mainly identifying with what you're seeing. You're withdrawing into your more inner mind process, and you may have to hear thoughts in your inner mind process, which is fine. Okay? And we're, this is a kind of vipassana type of meditating, an analytic seeing type of meditating. Okay? So the first thing you want to do is you all know that the foundation of Buddha's teaching and, and you talk about Yandengopo's teaching and Genla's teaching is, Nagarjuna's teaching is selflessness. And what that means is that uh, it doesn't mean we don't exist, but it means that we don't exist as some sort of absolute self. Something that is real, a real, uh, fixed identity, independent from any other circumstance. That's the fixed identity that is the real us. That's what that means. But in order to really understand what it means to realize selflessness, we have to have an idea of well, what could be the meaning of this sort of fixed identity. Well, who's talking about a fixed identity anyway? Maybe I, I have trouble remembering who I am. So what is this? We might think. So the first step in this meditation is to try to remember a time when you were deeply offended, someone accused you of something you didn't do, and you wouldn't do, actually. Some, you know, some mistaken thing. And for some reason, you're, you're accused. Try to remember a time when you felt offended. And try to remember it 
before you got indignant and then angry. You know, you might, Gela the other day was talking a lot about anger, which I was very pleased. I would need to hear more about it. And, you know, there's a sequence. First something offends you, then you feel indignant that you were offended. And then when this offense, protest, indignation is not attended to by whatever offended you, you then become angry. Right? And so, so you know that sequence. It's all right, you're meditating, but you're thinking along with what I'm saying. And so you just think, try to remember a time when you felt offended. Like what it was like. And how a feeling from within of, I should not have that happen. I did not do that. I, you know, this is unacceptable to me. A kind of, you know, like reaction from the gut happens, then you will remember. And of course, it takes working, and you have to work on that. Try to remember that time. And when you do, you might have an inkling that this chain reaction of emo emotions, of notions and emotions, coming from that experience of offense, of being accused unjustly, seems to arise from a place that is unquestionable, that's the solid you. It's like the real me, that's where the real me draws the line. The real me would never do that. The real me is innocent, the real, etc. It's righteous, it's that old kind of thing. So it feels like, you know, a swooshing energy that will end in fury. And we must have all had that sequence seems to come from the really real place within us. It's not just sort of like a flow of water coming from we know not where. It comes from a real place inside. So the first, the beginning of this meditation in selflessness is this first focus on the inkling of being an absolute, fixed, independent, identity, holding self, identifiable, objective self. So you will discover, when you, if you pursue this meditation at length, which we don't have time to do in this setting, you will discover that you don't at a visceral level, you don't agree with Buddha or with the Upanishadic teachers. 